I, I wake up, I'm very blurry. I, I, I had no idea what I'd been through. And there she is. She's holding my hand, looking into my eyes. She said two words, just two words. She said, I'm here. I'm here for you. Boy, those were the right two words because I was incredibly disoriented from this entire experience, but I wasn't alone. I wasn't waking up in an ICU with a nurse who I didn't know. She was right there holding my hand, looking right into my eyes, saying, I'm here. And what I see every day is metaphorically, we're all in a car accident every day. We've all had something go horribly wrong. What I encourage people to do is to just be fully present and say, it's okay, I'm here. How can I help? I'm here. Thank you for your help. I'm here. You're not alone. That's the presence that a real leader has to have every moment of every day. Greetings, everyone. My name is Julie Masters, and you are listening to another episode of Inside Influence, in which I delve into the minds of some of the world's most fascinating influencers or experts in influence to get to the bottom of what it really takes to own your voice and then amplify it to drive an industry, a conversation, a movement, or a nation. Now, here's today's question. What's your leadership blueprint? I'm not talking about your values or a description of how you operate at your best on the best day when everything is going according to plan. I'm talking about a roadmap of clearly defined behaviors, rituals, and practices that exactly define the type of leader that you want to show up as every day. You know, there's, there's an age old saying that we get the leaders we deserve, and maybe that's true. And it's certainly a conversation for another day, but today's conversation comes at it from a different angle that rather than getting the leaders we deserve, which is somewhat out of our control, we become the leaders we decide to build. And like any successful building project, that takes a carefully considered blueprint from the foundations of setting a clear intention to moving through to building the walls of our daily non-negotiable actions. And my guest today literally wrote the book on how to do that. Doug Conan is the only former Fortune 500 CEO who is a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling author. He is a top 50 leadership innovator, a top 100 leadership speaker, and one of the 100 most influential authors in the world. A devoted leadership practitioner and teacher, Doug's 45-year career has been defined by achieving high performance through an intentional, now say that again, an intentional commitment to studying, practicing, improving, and spreading the tenets of leadership that works. He is the founder and CEO of Conant Leadership, former president and CEO of Campbell Soup Company, and former chairman of Avon Products. His Wall Street Journal bestselling book, co-authored with Amy Federman, is called The Blueprint, Six Practical Steps to Lift Your Leadership to New Heights. He is also the New York Times bestselling co-author of Touchpoints, creating powerful leadership connections in the smallest of moments. Now, in this conversation, we get straight into the importance of setting and anchoring intention as a leader and why as leaders, we're so often thrown into the deep end with pretty much no roadmap to follow. His fundamental belief that your life story is your leadership story and how vital the often uncomfortable act of digging in getting real and learning to tell that story is when it comes to making a mark as a leader. How to build your own personal leadership model. Now, to be honest, I was a little bit stunned with this one. It just, it hadn't occurred to me that you got one, that we got one. I get my own leadership model. You know, read one in a book. Yes. Inherit one from a mentor. Yes. But write my own, put it on paper and then commit to showing up for it on a, on a daily basis. Now that's that's a different ball game. That's an interesting thought. We also covered how to create a practice treasury, a treasure chest of small actionable steps that you are willing to commit to that will on a daily basis lead you to higher ground. And why developing your own leadership blueprint provides the ultimate foundation for dealing with the winds of your life. No shortage of winds right now, both as a leader and as a human being. Now, my takeaway from this conversation seems pretty simple in hindsight, but 
I've been thinking about it a lot since we recorded. You know, if leadership is the hardest and most vital job on earth, then it deserves a plan, right? You wouldn't build a giant hotel without some considered thought about exactly what you wanted to build. And yet, somehow, at all levels in society, we seem to believe that leadership should be innate, learnt the hard way, sink or swim, survive or die. How different would our organizations, our communities, and our political systems be if, before even stepping into the journey of leadership, we asked for a plan? Not of what they wanted to do, there's no shortage of plans of what, what people want to do, but a clear set of intentions and commitments that mark how they are intending to show up. Just imagine the cumulative effect of that, of all those plans in action, of all that accountability, of all that growth. Now imagine the opposite. The current absence of it feels kind of strange, right? Until that day, until that day comes, any leader that arrives with a blueprint has an incredible opportunity to distinguish themselves from everybody else in their space. So buckle up, you're about to learn how to do it. If you are looking to take your journey in influence to the next level right now, don't worry. Hop onto my website or the show notes and download the latest version of my ebook, The Influencer Code. It is literally 20 years of my life and career working with influencers, driving conversations, working with brands to raise their thought leadership. And it covers the seven areas and the seven core questions that hands down are the most powerful when it comes to rapidly increasing your influence. Just pop in your email address and it will be in your inbox in the time it takes to pour a cup of tea. My newsletter, Influence Insider, also gives one bite-sized tool, strategy, or mindset shift per week, all on the topic of building a more influential life. Once again, hop onto my website, juliemasters.com, to become an insider. But for now, stride on, stretch out, drive safe, and soak up the well of leadership wisdom that is Doug Fern. Welcome to the podcast, Doug Conant. Thank you. It's it's wonderful to be here. Such a pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm gonna. There's so many things I want to ask you today, so I'm gonna jump straight into the question that I usually kick off with, and that is the question of what one idea is having the most influence on your thinking right now. And and for those of you who haven't listened to this podcast before. The basis behind this question is that people that have influential ideas, people who have interesting ideas usually find or are looking for interesting ideas before the rest of us. So over to you. What's the one? Well, the, the one that's been top of mind I, today, but also during this entire pande- season of pandemics, it, it, I wish it was my idea. I, I, it, it comes from Stephen Covey, actually, of all people. And he used to say, Doug, what matters most must never be at the mercy of what matters least. And as we're in a period of disequilibrium in the workplace, but also in our personal lives and in our communities, I'm finding myself reflecting on that question and saying, what matters most now? Uh, Because all this disequilibrium creates more questions than it provides answers. And so I've been really focusing, trying to stay focused every day on what matters most now. And uh, it, it, it never, it hasn't left me. I probably haven't gone a day without thinking about that. If you don't mind me asking, how, how are you answering that question right now? It, for me, it comes back to the people with whom I'm traveling with that day or in, in this life. So it's all about the people. And, and, uh, and I find myself asking, am I paying attention to what matters most with the people with whom I'm traveling with right now, today, Julie Masters? Am I, am I focusing on what matters most right now? And it's inevitably the people and it's inevitably searching out a way to be of service uh, in a way that really leverages my ability to contribute. And so that's uh, right now it's people and it's helping them navigate in a supportive way, you know, the travails of this pandemic, which are creating more stress and more anxiety and more uncertainty than anyone could have imagined uh, just two years ago. I remember uh, 
another mentor of mine, a fellow by the name of Warren Bennis, who's written a lot of leadership books. He passed away, I want to say, two years ago. But uh, Warren uh, coined the phrase in 1987 that it was a VUCA world. V-U-C-A. It's a VUCA world in 1987. And VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. That's what VUCA means. And if it was a VUCA world in 1987, today it is a VUCA world on steroids. And that's what we're all wrestling with. And we're all looking for a point of light in a very gray day to help us navigate the day. Forget the week or, or the year. It's the day. And, uh, and it feels like everyone I talk to has a pandemic story. Uh, you wouldn't believe what happened to me today. Uh, and everyone I talk to, whatever they do, has taken two extra steps than it used to take. You're not going to believe this. And so I'm always sitting there trying to figure out how can I be useful in a world that feels as if it's been turned upside down. And, uh, and that leads me to trying to be a model of consistency in a very chaotic world, which I think is what leaders need to do today. And that's what I, that's what I preach and that's what I try and practice. A, a good friend of mine, she's been on the podcast a couple of times, Mass Farrelly, and she, she was saying to me a couple of weeks ago, she said, you know what? I'm so tired of hearing the words unprecedented times. She said, every time I hear it, the one thing I come back with was, can you, can you imagine, or can you remember a time in your life that was precedented? Have we like, has there ever been a precedented time, a time that wasn't filled with kind of uncertainty and, and figuring it out and, and newness and waves of change, you know, this is a heightened version of that, but we're constantly going through these evolutions. We're constantly, if we show up for it, we're constantly going through it. I absolutely understand that. I, I'm uh, speaking to you from my home in Chicago, Illinois today. And uh, there was a television show on last night about uh, the Great Chicago Fire, which happened in, 18, in the middle 1800s, where the entire city was devastated. And there were pictures of Chicago then. And Chicago today is feeling a lot of stress from the pandemic on a variety of fronts. But I'm looking at what those people were dealing with in 1850. They would have said, these are unprecedented times. And, uh, and, and you know, and then I think of my grandparents, whose, whose grandparents live with them, who lived for, through the American Civil War and remembers the devastation of half of our country during that war. That was unprecedented times. My parents grew up in the Depression here in the United States. They would tell you that was unprecedented. Um, those were unprecedented times. My father went and fought in World War II in Asia Pacific, and he would tell you those were unprecedented times. So, you know, uh, any student of history, which we all ought to be, uh, would be able to put this in a larger context. All that having been said, these are unprecedented times. The rate of change, it's a VUCA world. The rate of change has accelerated like never before. And there is a lot of stress on the system. And it's stress, from my perspective, that is getting is of, of an amazing scale when you start talking about climate change, you start talking about things where you feel life itself could be at risk, you know? So the scale is larger, the rate of change is greater, but for us to feel as if we're the first generation that's been through stress, uh, that's a fool's errand. What I wanted to dive in with you today on was, was the entire premise behind your book and behind a lot of your work. And we're talking about it now in, in a way, which is, you know, showing up intentionally through the winds of change, showing up with a, with a clear vision, with a clear path forward. And so that brings me onto the blueprint, brings me onto the blueprint. Why do we need, and you use the blueprint as a context for leadership. We're going to be talking about leadership today, but it can also be, you know, in the wider perspective of your, of your life. Why do we need a blueprint? 
this, we all lead a life. So the leadership we're talking about is leading a life that focuses on what matters most. Okay. To go back to where we started. And from my perspective, uh, I do it through the lens of leadership because leaders have a profound impact on large groups of people, on groups of people. And so I, I use that lens and, and I have that experience that most people that write about this don't. Uh, but uh, I guess I'm going to give you a real simple answer. Most of us lead life by the seat of our pants. All right. And challenges are getting bigger. Change is going faster. And we're going by the seat of our pants. And we're, are we surprised that it's not going that well? No, of course it's not going well. You're doing it by the seat of your pants. You do podcasts. Okay. You're mu probably much better on this podcast because you've worked at it than you were on your first one. Let's hope so. <laughs> oh, let's, I mean, I went back and listened to some of the early ones recently and, and yes, let's hope so because they were woeful. Well, guess what? Why, why are you better? Because you focused on it. You learned about it, worked at it and you became proficient. Okay. Uh, the same thing is true about leading a life. You got to think about it, figure out what matters most to you. And then you got to, create a framework for how you want to walk in this world. And then you've got to put one foot in front of the other. And, uh, and, you know, short of doing that, it's hard to imagine that you're serving yourself or anybody else that's traveling with you very well. And people need you to show up at your very best every day. And guess what? I talk to all these people from all these walks of life in all these geographies, and they all hunger to do better because they know they're leading life by the seat of their pants and it does, it's not very fulfilling. And so you say, well, how can I help? Which is one of the things that I carry, have always car have carried with me for 40 years from a friend. And so how can I help you get to a place where you, the best version of yourself can be on display? And guess what? You're needed that way every day. And how can I help you get to a place where you find that best version of yourself and you show up so that you're not only helping others, but what we find is when you find what that looks like, it's also incredibly fulfilling for you. You know, most of the leaders I work with today, uh, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup and guess what? They all feel like empty cups. Why? Because they're doing it by the seat of their pants. They don't know. They're not really showing up the way they want to show up. They're showing up the way they feel they have to, but they haven't really thought about that. And 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 so they're surprised. They're exhausted. Hello. Is anybody thinking about this? What I love about the work, what I love about the way that you designed the work. And I think that that's important to kind of highlight for a second. The way that you have so consciously designed the work is it's very practical. It's a really practical guide and it struck me as I was going through it, how impractical the way that we usually do leadership is, you know, you get promoted as a leader because you're good at your job. You get thrown into this position completely in the deep end and you have to navigate your way through these murky, sometimes shark infested waters with no roadmap, very little roadmap. Maybe you could buy a few books, maybe you don't. And it's the same in the wider context of life. You know, someone hands you a baby. Suddenly you're like, okay, I gotta, um, um, gotta swim very fast right now. So the work you have designed is so so practical. Was that was that deliberate to give a, a practical guide, or was it just the way that it evolved? That what we found is, you have to do it with great courage. And guess what? It's hard to have the courage of your convictions if you don't know what your convictions are. And if you're doing this by the seat of your pants. You don't have a very strong foundation. You don't have. You can't lead or influence others with conviction. You're you're just doing the best you can with what you have, and you're and you feel like you're part of the sea of victims. Uh, look at all this stuff that's been heaped on top of me. I have no control here. I have no power. I'm just doing the best I can. And then people wonder, well, why isn't that fulfilling? If all you can say to yourself at the end of the day is, well, I did the best I could with what I had. That's that's a pretty hollow, feels hollow to me, a hollow victory. And I know leaders can do better. And the frustrating thing is I talk to them all and they all hunger to do better. 
So you say, well, you want to do better. You know you can do better. Why don't you do better? Well, I don't have time. I'm swamped. It's a VUCA world. You know, I, I, I get up. I get the children. We get the children up and off to school. If we have children, we walk the dog. And as soon as I get up, before the children get up, I'm thinking about what do I have to do today? What's my agenda? Check my email. Check my text messages. Get the kids. Rush off to rush them off to school. And then I get then I get in the car I, or on the bus and I go to work. And I'm working all day, just fighting, you know, doing the best I can with what I've got, just reacting by the seat of my pants. And, and then I'm exhausted when I get home. What do I do? I have to take care of the kids and put the, I give them an hour of my time and then I put them to bed and then I get an email again and I do work all day. Uh, and, and they say, how, you know, I want to do better. How can I do better in a practical way? And the reason we wrote the book is we believe there is a practical way. And, and I would tell you, and I've seen this everywhere, that the only way out of this is to go in, to go inside yourself and find the seeds of greatness that are within you. And I guarantee they're there and tap into those seeds of greatness so that you can be of service in a way that means something to you. And by the way, it will also enable you to do a better job. And you can get after this in a week, couple weeks worth of work. And you won't get all the way to bright. The other part of what I talk about is, uh, you know, what are they? Uh, Stephen Covey had another great line. He said, Doug, you cannot talk your way out of something you behaved your way into. You need to behave your way out of it. Uh, life is not one quick fix. And so what we do is we help with the blueprint. We help people create this foundation that they need so they know what their convictions are. And then we help them gently improve it in a continuous improvement way so that it's not overwhelming. It's just part of how they walk in the world. But to do that, they have to go inside. They have to reflect. They have to do a little studying about the world around them. And, uh, and, 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 and then they have to create, they have to define for themselves how they want to walk in the world. We call it a leadership model. How do you, how do you want to lead in a way that speaks to you, that works for you? And this leadership model, what's interesting is no two are the same. You know, we read books that you got to do these 13 things or you go to a job and they say, here's your performance review. These are the 10 characteristics you have to you know, we're going to evaluate you on. Well, that's wonderful so that everybody in the organization knows what's expected. That's helpful. But it's insufficient because you have to know what works for you, not just what works for them. I think that was, you know, for me when I, I mean, I started out in leadership, I, I was like 25, I think, 25, started a new company, suddenly part of starting a company is you get, you get staff, right? You get team and, and you're drawing up agreements and you're managing clients. And, you know, I learned very quickly that, okay, the best way to lead, let me look around me. Okay. You look really powerful and influential. I'll do it how you're going, how you're doing it. And you try on that jacket and you're like, no, no, it's exhausting. This isn't working. And so you look somewhere else and you're like, okay, I'll try, I'll try that one. Try that on. And I think, you know, you, you try all these different ways and then eventually that process of trying to be everybody else gets so tiring that eventually you go, you know, either I show up as, as either I find a way to show up as a version of me that has gravity, that has influence to it, or I'm going to just burn out here. Like I'm going to, I'm going to burn out pretty quick. Well, you know, uh, Julie, that's all these leaders I run into. That's sort of the journey they're on. And, you know, they're sort of lost at sea and they're grabbing for whatever is the shiny leadership approach of the day. And uh, and I did that, too. I studied I've been studying leaders uh, since college when I was or actually since I was a child reading autobiographies of athletes and then and then went to college and then studied uh, U.S. history, American presidents. And then I went into political science from there and I studied world leaders. Then I went to, into business and I studied business leaders. I've been 
a student of leadership for a long, long time. And, you know, I'd go through phases. I went, I would go through my Gandhi phase and I would want to be the change that everyone saw, you know, that I saw in the world. And I, and I would go through these various phases, never very fulfilled, but there were elements that did speak to me. And that, that now today I do carry with me and we can talk about that in a few minutes, but what we find is, you know, Brene Brown, I did a podcast with Brene, uh, in the spring and I, one of my maxim is, maxims is that your life story is your leadership story. And we will get into that, uh, probably right after this comment, but when she, the prior year, before I knew I was going to be on her podcast, every year I pick a, a quote that I use a lot that sort of has spoken to me that year. And this would have been in 2020. And I picked one of Brene's quotes. And at the time, I didn't even know her. And uh, her quote was, you can either walk in your own story and own it. Or you can walk in someone else's story and hustle for your worthiness every day. And what you were doing when you were trying to be this leader or that leader, you were hustling for your worthiness. And it was exhausting. I had the same thing. I grew up as an oldest child. So I was hustling for my worthiness in terms of my what my parents thought I should be doing and my grandparents. And then I went to school and I was hustling for my worthiness as an oldest, trying to follow the teacher's model. And then I had coaches in athletics and I was trying to live up to my coach's model. And then my professors at university and then my bosses, of which I've had a lot. And uh, I was I was sort of trapped in this thing of just as you described it for yourself. And it was exhausting. So it's since I've been 32, I'm now 70, 38 years I've been working on this and uh, I've been trying to find my story. And I got to tell you, when you find your story. And you start living it, your whole world changes because you're being true to yourself. And it's it's just so energizing. And even in a pandemic, I am energized every day because I'm working on stuff that matters. And I'm working from a platform that says, OK, today I'm going to show up and work on what matters most. And I'm going to help someone today. Just to jump on that for a second, you know, it takes time. Right. It's it's really hard to read the label on the on the jar when you're in the jar. Right. Like it it takes time. And again, to, I'm, I'm going to take us back to the process now because I really want to get into the process of the blueprint. It takes time and it takes a, pr a practical mindset to go, OK, I'm going to uncover this layer by layer by layer consistently day after day, week after week, month after month as a leader in any capacity. So let's start. Um, I want to start at the beginning of the process. I'm going to touch on some of the core pieces here. So the beginning of the process you call envision, which is about setting an anchoring intention. Why, why is intention so important? Well, I'll go back to the earlier part of our conversation. Uh, I regard leading people. Now I'm going to do it in a leadership context uh, for leaders of any organization. Uh, I believe that role, when you're a leader, you're on sacred ground. You're having a profound impact on others. When we talked about the day of the life of the working person a little earlier, they were spending more of their waking hours thinking or doing work than they were thinking about their family, their love, anything. It was all about work. To me, if I'm impacting that, for me, that is sacred ground. And most leaders feel that. When you were starting your company, it was exhausting trying to set the table, get the team working. You wanted, you wanted to perform and you wanted everybody happy. And I mean, and, and, and they want to be that way too. So I, I, my premise is you're on sacred ground. So if you're going to be on sacred ground, you have to do better than seat of your pants. And where do you start? You figure out, well, you acknowledge, well, I'm choosing to do this. So first of all, this is a choice. You know, uh, uh, in Anna Karenina, Tolstoy had this great quote. He said, happiness is not about outward things. It's about how you choose to view them. And you need to choose to view this leadership as an opportunity to make a difference and to be fulfilling. So we challenge leaders and aspiring leaders to think, what's your purpose in leadership? 
let's begin with the end in mind. What are you hoping to do here? Well, I've never thought about it. Okay, well, this is a good start. Let's think about it. And by the way, when we go through the process, we'll go through the six steps very quickly here. Uh, when we when you go through the process, the one thing you know is whatever you write down is wrong because you've never done it before. You're just going to go back and iterate through it again. You don't ride a bike the first time you get on it. You know, you learn. But, you know, what we do know is I've done this enough now where it's going to be 60 to 70 percent right. You'll go through the process. You'll come out the other end and you'll come back to it and say, OK, how can I do a little better with that today? So you start out with purpose and knowing it's wrong. But then we challenge people to go into a reflect stage where they look at their life journey and what can they learn from it. And then they go to a study stage. I'll describe each one briefly. They, they study, they go outside the four walls of their life and they look at the broader world around them. We call that study, the third step. And they say, okay, I've looked at my personal life. I've learned. I'm looking at the world around me. I've studied. And now I'm going to apply that learning to build a plan. You know, leaders I talk to, they have plans for everything. You have a plan for your podcast, okay? If I talk to a leader about what's your leadership plan, they roll their, they don't know. Seat of the pants, not good enough. Sacred ground, want to make a difference, and you want to do better. Not good enough. So let's have a plan. We call it a leadership model. And then we say, well, a plan's great. We've all been to leadership development programs. I have, we all have. Okay, that's great, but so far it's just a concept. The fifth step is practices. Okay, how are you going to show up in a way that's consistent with the plan? And we're going to spend a lot of time on showing up. How are, how are you going to tangibly demonstrate that this is the best version of yourself that you can imagine today and show up that way in service to others? And then the other thing we know is whatever you do when you show up, which is step five, practice, uh, the sixth step, the last step is improve because you, you know that you can do better tomorrow than you did today. You've learned. And so we encourage people to go through these six steps, which are envision, reflect, study, plan, practice, and then commit to improving. Go back to the beginning again. OK, I've been through this this week. Do I have the right thought about what I want to do? Am, am I envisioning this clearly now that I've been through it once? And you make it 5% better. And then is there anything I missed in my reflection that could help me do a little bit better tomorrow than I did today? And inevitably there is. I mean, so just to go up a second before we go down, I want to drill down in some, to some of the pieces of the work that really spoke to me and re, I would, that I've really taken and applied in my own life. But to go up for a second, you know, for leaders, if you build this plan out, you take some time to get conscious and intentional about building this plan out and then to speak to the habits part of it, to have a ritual that's in your diary, like once a week, you can do it once a day if you want to, you're a, you're a better human than me, but once a week, once every couple of weeks to go through it again, okay, how's this feeling now? How's this feeling now? What can I adjust and adapt now? What did I learn now? That's the only way that we get better. That's the only way that it happens. The only way. And it's not once a week. It's every day. And uh, and but they're small enough that you can do that. I, I view the habit piece. Uh, gosh, I wish I would I would love to have James Clear on the other side of the screen with you, with you. But, uh, you know, I look at it for leaders. I look at it at three levels. There's how you lead yourself, how you lead your colleagues at work and how you lead. The, the other people beyond your work uh, in terms of uh, the, in the broader world, all within your circle of influence, your ability to actually make a difference. And in that model, you park all your circle of concerns, which is all about the world is falling apart, but I can't do anything about it. You put that all in the parking lot for a minute and you say, OK, how am I going to show up differently? I'll give you a simple habit. I was fired from a job. Uh, when I was 32 years old, which changed my life. And uh, uh, my outplacement counselor, who I, I talk about in the book quite a bit, and it was an incredible influence on my life, 
uh, when I called him to make an appointment at the end of that horrible, horrible day, I, he, he answered the phone and has said, hello, uh, this is Neil McKenna. How can I help? And this was before caller ID. This was before cell phones. It was, it was the old landline with the rotary dial. And uh, so he, uh, and every time he answered the phone, that's how he answered the phone, not knowing who was on the other end of the phone. And it could have been the plumber. How can I help? He adopted that mindset. And he brought it into every interaction. And that was so authentically Neil. When he passed away in 2006, let's see, 15 years ago, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to make that uh, uh, that day in April, whatever, middle of April, I'm going to make that my how can I help day. And I'm going to take the day off and I'm going to do something profound that's helpful. And I did that for two years. And then I thought, this is stupid. I ought to be trying to help people. In fact, my nature is to want to be helping people mm -hmm. every day. Let's go back up to intention for a second, because it all anchors there, hence why it's the first step. What does that, I think we all have a feel for what the word intention means, but what does it look or sound like in practice? So I'm a leader. I'm getting clear on my intention. How do I start to develop the language? What does it sound like in practice? Well, I would tell you, uh, uh, the first one you write is irrelevant. It's just a starting point. As you go through the model and you do the reflection and the study and the plan, and then you try and implement it with practices, and then you say, how can I do better? As you iterate a few times, that intention becomes informed in a way that is helpful. The first time you write it, you could write anything. You have to go through the process a couple of times, which incidentally, I, I do a boot camp in two days. We get this with home, with pre-work, but two days. So this is not like you got to go to university and get an MBA. Uh, but uh, so the intention starts as you refine it. It, 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 it is your guiding light. Like I have a long winded intention right now uh, that is too long, but it, every word means something to me. Uh, you know, I intend my 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 purpose i intend to help build high trust high performance teams that honor people which is at the heart of my model that honor people defy the critics and thrive in the face of adversity all those words matter to me so when i think about my intention that is my rudder in the water and you know and we're all in very stormy seas so i can ask myself every day how am i doing Am I am I help helping? Am I de demonstrating an intention to help build high trust, high performance teams that honor people, defy the critics, and thrive in the face of adversity? And so that's the power of it. It is your rudder in the water. That's a wonderful statement, but it's insufficient because you actually said you have to think more about this, and you have to say, well, how am I going to do that? You know, it, it, that's a wonderful, lofty intention. How am I going to bring that to life? The fun one is on the reflect step, the next step. When I lost my job, my, my, second, my second meeting with this Neil McKenna fellow, he said, Doug, I want you to write your entire life story down. Write, handwrite, and he wanted me to handwrite it, and I typed it which was good because I couldn't type very well. So, and plus when you lose your job, you have time to write. So I, I, uh, I took two weeks, I hand wrote my life story, everything. He said, I want everything. Growing up, people who had an influence on you, where your family came from, uh, everything. So I turned in uh, 50, they were roughly 50 pages, handwritten both sides on lined paper is like we had in school. And uh, he read it and I met with him two weeks later and he said, Doug, this is very confusing to me because I meet you here and you're sort of, you've had a devastating experience. You're out of work. You have two small children and a very large mortgage. 
and you're very stressed out. I see you here. And then I read about this amazing person who has had an amazing life, who has learned a lot of important lessons from family, from friends, who is really well, pretty well anchored in, in the person he's trying to be. These are two different people. How you're showing up with me and how you're showing up at work, it feels as if you're just trying to go along to get along. I know you're introverted and I know you're shy. And I was at that point. Obviously, I'm not anymore. Uh, but and and he said, but then I read about this person who has extraordinary capacity and who is, you know, has so much to offer the world. These are two different people. And and Doug, this is the person you need to be. You need to be yourself. Your life story is pointing you in this direction. And so we've taken that learning and we have people basically catalog their life story for us, which is incredibly helpful for everyone. There, we had a, a, a young lady who's the uh, chief human resource officer for a professional uh, major league baseball team. She's remarkably young and she's crackerjack. She's wonderful. So she was in class and uh, and she said at the end of it, uh, she, you know, we have them people do reflections at the end of this two day boot camp. And she said, this this has been amazing to me because I've been so exhausted. And I realized I'm showing up at work as this very young, high potential contributor who's given been given this amazing responsibility for this professional team and surrounded by older white men. And I'm showing up the way I think they want me to. I'm not showing up as myself. And I wonder why I'm getting so exhausted. Well, I've, I'm not an old white man. I, you know, I have great ability to contribute, but I'm not tapping into it. I'm, and, and so she said, oh my gosh, how this has been really enlightening. I, I'm sort of losing my way here. And we went through another exercise about, okay, how are you going to go back and how are you going to bring the new, the, the, the best version of yourself to life with this group? And we uncovered two or three things she could do the next week that would start to showcase her in all of her great beauty and her ability to contribute that would also honor the expectations of the organization. Most people think, well, I have to show up that way at work. That's bullshit. You have to get the job done and you have to inspire the people around you. And guess what? You can do that and still be yourself. I guarantee it. 99 out of 100 times. One of my one of my f favorite books probably about a couple of years ago now is called The The Alter Ego Effect. And I went away. I try and go away for a couple of days. It's, always a juggle with a, with a small family, but I try and go away for a few days every year by myself and just, you know, do the reading and the considering and, and the, the sitting with intention. And I read this book and the, the essence, and I recommend anybody read this book, but I'll go into the essence of it. The essence of the book is that we all exactly what you just said. We all have people who have had a massive impact on us, who we would love to show up like, you know, if I could show up like that person, that would be amazing. And to, while you're practicing these traits that you want to develop to keep that person very clearly in your mind's eye. And something that I did as a habit off the back of that book, and I don't think I've ever mentioned it on the podcast before, because it sounds vaguely bizarre, not vaguely bizarre, very bizarre, is I printed out pictures of these people. There's six of them. I'm not going to go into who it is. There's six of them. And I, <laughs> I bought a laminator. And I laminated this picture. I printed it out, six people printed it out. I laminated it. It is up in my shower. And it go, it's up in my shower. And every day when I'm taking a shower, and the reason I don't want to mention their names is because nobody wants to know that someone's looking at them in the shower. Um, the, but it re-anchors me back into what was it about them? Was it the energy? Was it the actions? How can I recalibrate into that at the beginnings of my day? Oh, that's beautiful. And, you know, when I do talks, uh, when I have slides, one of the slides I use is my entourage of excellence, which I call a tapestry. And it's the pictures of the people that I carry with me, you know, and 
Maya Angelou, I, I encourage you to go do this. Maya Angelou, if you Google Maya Angelou, rainbows in my clouds, okay? Uh, she does, it's two minutes long. And, uh, and, and, you know, we often talk that leadership is a lonely pursuit. You're all alone. And I also say that's bullshit too. You're only alone if you choose to be. And Maya Angelou will, in this little rainbows in my clouds, she talks about rainbows in her clouds. She says, I've had a lot of clouds, but I've had a lot of rainbows too. All these people that have had a positive influence on me, when I go up on the stage or when I go to teach a class, I say to all those people, I say, come on with me. We're going up on stage now. Those are the six people that are in your shower. Come on with me. We're going up on the stage now. We're going to show up. She said, I bring them all with me. They're with me all the time. They are rainbows in my clouds. And then she challenges you, the listener, to say, okay, your challenge now is to be a rainbow in somebody else's clouds. And that's what we're talking about here. You know what these things look like. You know what good energy looks like in a deeply personal way that really speaks to you. And what we encourage people to do is build their own tapestry, create their own entourage of excellence, and then carry it with them all the time. I mean, I travel with mine. And, uh, you know, Stephen Covey's in it. Neil McKenna's in it. Maya Angelou's in it. Uh, uh, Gandhi is in it. And a ton, a number of other people. I have way too many, but but I've been doing this a long time, and I've just I've learned so much from these people. And I've said, gosh, you know, my I had a favorite president president of the United States. His name was Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, and he did a lot of things wrong, but I loved his energy, and he had the eye of the tiger, and he showed up and he engaged every day, and. I want to bring that with me when I deal with the likes of you. Uh, <laughs> no, but when, when we're into this, this is important stuff, sacred ground. And I, I, I want to share my passion for it, and my energy for it. And uh, so I'm, I'm channeling my inner Teddy Roosevelt right now. And uh, so I love your story. It, it's very aligned with my experience. We know what these people look like. There are lessons to be learned. We've learned them. Our challenge is to integrate them in, into how we show up every day. And you can do that. I want to I want to dive into the leadership model side of things as well while we're here, because for me, this is the, the big, well, intention is very huge. If you do one thing, let it be that. But this model side of things, which is where you get deeply practical about this is my leadership model. These are the pillars of leadership that I strive to, to model my entire behavior around. Can you, firstly, can you walk through what a model would look like? Again, let's just get practical with it. What does a model look like? And then we can move into how we develop our own. A model is anything that guides your thinking and your behavior in a direction where you're influencing others in a way that is showcasing the best version of yourself. Uh, my wife has a leadership model and my wife is a creative actress educator. She's not me for sure. Thank God. And her leadership model is, is a set of words. It's travel. Well, is her model. And she would say that to our kids. Travel well stands for take responsibility, add value, enjoy life. That's the travel. And well is a welcome everyone, live, love, and laugh because she's always trying to find, she always tries to get too much in and she ended up with three L's for well. But that's my, that's how my wife wants to walk in the world. Take responsibility, add value, enjoy life, welcome everyone, live, love, and laugh. And uh, and that guides how she shows up. And if she ever has a bad day, she can look at that model and say, where did I go wrong? Did I take responsibility? Was I so empty today that I wasn't adding value? You know, or, or, or was I not welcoming to people? Uh, and so... I, I, I picked that model. So that can be it. Mine is a sort of a, a geometric flywheel because I'm 
a model builder. Uh, so models take on, uh, are imbued with the mindset of whoever has created it. We have master gardeners that think about leadership within a gardening metaphor. You know, we need the sun. We need the elements to shine on. We have to prune the tree or prune the plant in order for it to fully blossom. We have to take care of the conditions, the soil. So we have people that build leadership models that speak to them, that help them be the best version of themselves, that are, it's a garden. We have, I have a, a world famous doctor uh, who, among other things, also happens to be a Star Trek geek. He goes and speaks at Star Trek conventions. And his model is a rocket ship going off into the unknown and creating a team that's going to get that rocket ship to where it needs to be. And it influences how he thinks about how he shows up every day. And if you're on his team, when you can articulate that model clearly, you get a rocket pin, which is one of his practices that that brings that to life, and uh, and and along with many other practices that he's developed over the years. So these pract these these models take the shape. We have marathoners that say this is a long journey. I've got to take care of myself before I start the journey. And then I've got to take care of myself as I'm on the journey in order to finish the race. And uh, we have, oh, and we have lots of engineers and architects that are building buildings. The blueprint concept is about a building. And uh, the whole blueprint notion uh, of the book is you got to build a strong foundation with your leadership in order to be able to withstand the the winds and the challenges uh, that you're undoubtedly going to uncover. And your building has to hold up under the fiercest conditions. So we want you to build a very strong foundation based on reflection and study. You build a strong foundation, and then you have pillars that are what are the three or four most important things to you that you want to have captured in your model on top of that foundation. And then what are your values, which most people end up putting on the roof? The roof is my, it creates my values. The pillars reflect how I want to show up. The foundation uh, uh, could be anything. We have trees, you, can, you know, with roots. And then the trunk is growing and the leaves and, and uh, you know, you can't get the fruits without the roots. And, so this model piece is, is designed to create a platform for people to channel in a way that speaks deeply to them, their deepest held leadership beliefs and brings them to life in a metaphor that, that, that speaks to them and that ultimately they can share with the people that work with them with conviction because they're, they're, they've thought about it. They're not doing this by the seat of their pants. They're doing this with a purpose. And so this model piece is, uh, a model is in the eyes of the beholder, I guess mm -hmm. is my point. And I just suddenly got that at a whole different level. I just suddenly really, it just went, da -da, the, the weaving together of your story, the reflection piece, your personal story and your personal model of leadership how those two pieces beautifully come together. You know, if you are somebody who loves gardening, then your model becomes a, a metaphor for gardening. If you're somebody who loves Star Wars or Star Trek, sorry, it becomes a, a model of a rocket. Like the, how deeply personal this process is. Yeah. Well, it, and it needs to be because uh, great leaders make it personal. Uh, nothing great was ever accomplished by anybody in an impersonal way. Not going to happen. You pouring yourself into how you do podcasts. If you were just asking questions, you know, here are the 10 questions I'm going to ask of every. Won't work. Won't work. You won't do anything of distinction and you can do better than that. And so this whole process is designed to be deeply personal and reflective of you 
and of you thinking about what's the best version of myself and also knowing that whatever I come up with today, I can do better tomorrow. And I will in a, in a manageable, small practice, uh, very intentional way. And so you, all of a sudden you have a sense of purpose. You envision, you reflect, you study, you build a leadership model, you identify practices. My number one at the heart of my model is honor people. That's the number one thing I want to do, honor people. And so I have practices. You know, when I divide my model, I share with the class. I say, OK, and here's some practices I use. I, I've evolved into where I'm honoring people. I'm bringing that notion of honoring people to life. How can I help? Uh, that mindset and asking that question is 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 one of my ways of honoring people. Another way I started writing when I was a terrible interview, which I was. I lucky I got a job. Uh, I needed to. Uh, my output, Neil McKenna said, "Doug, you're going to be a terrible interview. You've got to think about some way to distinguish yourself. What do you do if you're an introvert?" Well, I had to come up with something. So I came up with a strategy that when I would go to interview at a, an office building, I would get the name of everybody that helped me. And then I, at the end, including the receptionist at the front of the building, I would get their name. And I would go through my day. I would pay great attention to how they were helping. I would then leave the building. I would walk next door to the coffee shop and I would handwrite a note to each person saying, thank you for your help today. It might've been three sentences. I appreciated this thing you did very tangibly. And, uh, and I would then walk it back to the office building and I would deliver it to the receptionist. And on top would be the note to the receptionist. And guess what? Receptionists never get thank you notes. So, uh, and, and then I would, could you have these delivered either today or tomorrow morning? Oh, you know, and, and I want to deliver your note right now. And so they would deliver them. The next time I went back to that office building, oh, Doug, it's good to have you back. Who are you seeing today? How can I help you? Uh, so those thank you notes, I started writing those at Campbell, uh, Campbell Soup Company when I was the CEO. <laughs> and I was there for 10 years. I tried to write 10 to 20 notes a day to people that were making real accomplishments of real significance. I had a two and a half hour commute to work. So I would sit there and read and write. And uh, on the way in, I would write 10 to 20 short notes celebrating contributions of real significance. I did it six days a week for 10 years. When I retired, uh, and it was my way of honoring people and, and honoring their work. It wasn't have a nice day. It was thank you for that great podcast I had an opportunity to be on yesterday. Or And I particularly appreciated this part of the conversation. So it was specific. And and so I 10 to 20 a day, they'd be sent out that day. And if it was in Australia and it was a real contribution, it would be FedEx to the employee's home. So they would open it with their family and they would see that this person got a thank you note from the CEO. Whoa. And so when I retired, I was being interviewed and the interviewer said, we hear you write a lot of notes. I said, well, I do 10 to 20 a day. I do it six days a week. It's sort of a habit, a, a practice. And uh, they said, well, how many of you written? I don't know. We did the math and I had sent out just to Campbell employees over 30,000 notes in 10 years. And, and, honoring people. And, uh, and we only had 20,000 employees. If you were at Campbell Arnott's in, in Melbourne, if you walked around the building, you would see handwritten notes from me stuck up on thumbtacks in cubicles from the CEO thanking you for some specific thing you did. Do you think everybody in the company didn't notice that the CEO was celebrating contributions of significance. All the people that work for me said, do you expect us to write these notes too? I said, I don't care what you do, but I think we ought to be celebrating contributions of significance. 
Most organizations, you've interviewed a lot of people. Most organizations are great critical thinking machines. We're built to figure out what's wrong and to fix it. As a result, we spend way too much time focusing on what's not working when even in even the most difficult circumstances, typically in a company, eight out of 10 things are being done right. But nobody's talking about it. You've got two young children. If all you focused on was what they were doing wrong, they probably would not grow up to be well-rounded children. You are also celebrating what they're doing right, and you're trying to bring balance into that conversation. Same thing's true as a leader. So those two things, how can I help? And thanking people for contributions of significance were my way, two of my ways of honoring people. And they're simple, you know? I'm also thinking one of the things that I've done in lockdown, which is different that I, that I had never done before, because previous to lockdown, I was on and off planes and, you know, small babies, very difficult to keep a very consistent schedule. And in lockdown, I got into this habit of walking. My husband would go to the gym. He would come back. We'd like tag team at the door. I'd head out for a walk for kind of half an hour, 45 minutes before the kids woke up. And I got into a habit. I would find this rock go sit on a rock. The beautiful thing about Sydney is that most people, you know, can find a rock with a view somewhere. There's so many beautiful views here. And I would pull out my phone and I would just think of two to three people in my life that I wanted to, to touch. That was it. It was very simple. It was, it was just a very simple text message or message or video. I would take a 10 second video of myself just saying, Hey, I'm just thinking about you. I hope you're doing okay. I'm sending you thoughts on my morning walk. Um, I hope you're well, take care. It was it. And just a regular practice every morning of doing that. And it was a beautiful, and it still is a beautiful way to start my day. James Clear would be very proud of you. If you didn't share that with him, you should have. These habits that not only, I think, probably lifted the spirit of the people who received them, but you felt good about it too. You filled your own cup up while you did that. My uh, co-author on my first book, Meta Norgard, who is an amazing leadership, de- she ran leadership development for Stephen Covey. She was the only woman there, and she ran the place. Uh, uh, she, you should get to know her and have her on sometime. She loves walk and talks. Uh, and Sanjay Gupta, just two weeks ago, was being interviewed about what's the best thing for uh, mental health through this pandemic. He said walk and talks physically and emotionally and socially. You go for that 30 minute walk with someone of significance in your life if you can. If not, you talk to them on the phone and you get your exercise, you have a connection and you fill your cup up. And so walking and talking, important, important. That one habit alone, I figured that one out the hard way. I used to manage a lot of CEOs had a management company for speakers and thought leaders. And so we had, you know, we had CEOs, we had authors, army, army generals, police officers, all, you know, for someone who's 25 at the time, 25 to 30, you know, leading in that capacity was a, was a massive jump into the deep end for me. And what I found was that Often one of the best ways to do that was to, if I sat opposite, if especially if it was a difficult conversation, if I sat face to face, you know, eyeball to eyeball, trying to have these conversations, it inevitably didn't go well. But if we walked, if we just took a walk together side by side, just took a walk together and talked, somehow the walk would work it out, just trusting that the walk would work it out. And I was talking to a mother recently and she said, you know what, her kids have just graduated, they're just leaving home. And she said, you know, when I asked them about what they remember about their childhood, all these massive things that we did, these big holidays, these huge, you know, experiences that I kind of bent myself over backwards to create. She said, when I asked them what they remember, they both said when you would take it, she would take it in turns to take us out for a 15 minute walk after dinner. And it would be my turn to go for a walk with mommy. And then the next day, it's just 15 minutes someone else's turn to go for a walk with mommy. And she, so we did nothing special. We literally just meandered around the neighborhood for 15 minutes, but it's the biggest thing that they remember. Oh, far, absolutely. And we have cultures, uh, Meta and I both do a lot of teaching uh, together and separately. We have cultures that have adopted walk and talk meetings. I mean, all around the world. It, it, it breaks down barriers. It, 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 it 
it's amazing. That is an amazing habit. Uh, and uh, so it's those small habits that can make a profound difference on how you show up. And if you land on habits that naturally fit into who you are, I'm an introvert. I'm better at writing notes than inter- doing an interview uh, uh, when I was looking for a job. Uh, that is what brings your candidacy. That's showing up, right? That's showing up. Oh, it's one of my final questions for you. We started this conversation by talking about the winds of change and the winds of our life and that having a blueprint, a conscious, deliberate blueprint enables us to weather the winds of our life. And I think it's no secret to say that the last couple of years have been kind of windy. Um, how, how have you used your blueprint to handle those moments in your life when for all of us, sometimes it's just easier to shut down. It's just easier to do the moment by moment to do the seat of our pants. Hey, look, I want to be real clear. 70% of my day every day is seat of the pants. You know, that's true of all of us. Nobody's perfect here, Uh, you know, but it used to be a hundred percent. Now I have 30% that really, you know, what matters most to me, honoring people on purpose, uh, with clear practices, uh, 30% of the time, I'm showing up in a more thoughtful and more intentional way. So let's put that all in perspective. We all have to live a life that demands we react, right? So for me, in this pandemic, I'm reacting like everybody else. I have good days and I have bad days. But my leadership model, and in my model, if you went to my website at conantleadership.com, you would see it in all its glory, or if you read the book, The Blueprint. Uh, there are three parts of an axle that fill my model, and that's where I go every day. And it's about honoring people. The next ring of that axle is inspiring trust. And the next ring of that axle is clarifying higher purpose. And for me, that's, those are the three things. And I ask myself every day, how am I doing? And I want to tell you every day, I am finding a way to act in a way that is in aligned with that model. So that uh, I don't sink very far for very long. Uh, You know, I, I, I have some horrible days, you know, I've had, you know, we all have some pretty devastating pandemic stories. And, uh, but every day I'm trying to show up with the people with whom I'm traveling that day and I'm going to honor them. I'm going to build trust with them. And I'm going to be operating from a perspective that says, I have a higher calling here. I have a higher purpose. And, and I hold myself accountable to that. So, uh, I don't ever sink very low. And uh, although, you know, I, as I said, 70% of the time I'm making it up, probably some days it's 90% of the time. It's never 100% of the time, never. And uh, that's what the power of a model does. You really think about it, you commit to it. And then we encourage people in the book to share it with others, which is really a step up in accountability. When you start sharing how you're going to show up with other people, you're trapped. you got to show up that way. So my kids know how I'm going to show up. My wife knows how I'm going to show up. My, the people I work with know my model. Everybody I teach knows where I'm coming from. I damn well, ought to, I, I'm very accountable for this stuff. And what a gift that is. I never lose sight of it. I'm making it part of the part of the language, you know, one of the things I tried to talk to my daughter about very early on, she was having trouble going to, to daycare to, she was having trouble going in. She's, she's naturally quite shy. And we started talking, I was like, what, what words can I give her? And we started talking about, you know, who do we want to be today? Who do we want to be? Do we want to be somebody who is kind? We want to be somebody who is curious and we want to be somebody who is courageous. And I used to get her to say courageous, like a lion, you know, what do you want to be? You want to be someone who's courageous. Like, and for that just became a little, again, habit or practice every morning. Who do we want to be today? It's kind, 
curious and courageous. And it was just enough to give her some language to go out into her day. But then you want to, you better believe that as she got bigger, if I wasn't living up to those words, then, you know, I'm, I'm hearing about it. You yeah. saying it out yeah, loud. That's, and you're helping her build her leadership model, believe it or not. That's part of a model. Those are the, those are the values that you're imbuing in her that, you know, she'll carry with her for, you know, in some way, shape or form the rest of her life, believe it or not, you're imprinting on her first five years. It's, it's done after five years and you're imprinting on her those values. Uh, and, and what a gift, what a gift. Well, there's plenty, um, plenty of, <laughs> plenty of things like any parent that I don't do well. So it's good. Okay. It's good to have conscious, well, intentional I moments. Well, and that's true of all of us. When we're leading too, we screw up every day. Well, it feeds back to what you, you know? were saying before, which is, you know, 90% of the time, 80% of the time, 70% on a good day. Um, you know, we are all by the seat of our pants. We are all winging it. We're all making it up, doing the best that we can in the moment. If we can just grab 10% of intentional, it's enough. Okay. To, to lead us out today, if I could give you a stage and a microphone, and put in front of you every single human being that you would want to influence. Every single leader out there who is just doing the best they can by the seat of their pants, what's the one thing that you would want them to know? Well, I, I'll share with you a, uh, a story and I'll cut, I'll, I'll make, I can make this a long story, but I'm gonna do a short version of it. Uh, on July 2nd, 2009, I was CEO of Campbell Soup Company and uh, I w it was a Friday afternoon. I was being driven home in order to go away with my family to a cottage for our 4th of July uh, holiday. And uh, my driver, I dozed off in the back seat, uh, and we were on something called the New Jersey Turnpike. You lived in the States. New Jersey Turnpike is like the Indy 500. It's like a, 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 a raceway on a 4th of July weekend with everybody trying to get to the shore for the week the, of the Atlantic Ocean for the weekend. And they're driving way too fast. It's overcrowded, it's dangerous. And my driver drove into the back of a stop dump truck going between 70 and 80 miles an hour. And uh, uh, the airbag deployed. Fortunately, we were on a large SUV, otherwise I wouldn't be here with you today. And uh, and the airbag deployed and he was okay. I had a seatbelt on, I was asleep, but the seatbelt saved my life, but it crushed my torso. And uh, I, I had uh, many life-threatening injuries. They cut me out of the car. They got me to a trauma center. I was in surgery for about 16 hours as a, uh, and they had to track my wife down, who was actually in another city, Washington, D.C., helping my daughter move into her first apartment because she started work on Monday after graduating from university. And so they were able, fortunately, to get my wife to uh, the hospital, to the trauma center, before I was out of surgery. They moved me into ICU, into the ICU, and I... They didn't know when I would recover, but my wife was able to sit with me in the ICU. I had 10 broken ribs, a broken clavicle, a broken sternum, but I really had life-threatening internal injuries. Uh, it was touch and go. Uh, and so she sat at my bedside and held my hand. Turns out I was out of it for hours. And the nurses were there saying, do you want to take a break? Do you want to get a comfort break? Uh, and she said, no, I'm, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to be here when he wakes up. I'm going to be holding his hand. I'm going to get emotional. Uh, and so I find, I wake up, I'm very blurry. I, I, I had no idea what I'd been through. And, uh, and there she is, she's holding my hand, looking into my eyes. And she is, and she said to me, she said two words, just two words. She said, I'm here. I'm here for you. And boy, those were the right two words 
because I was incredibly disoriented from this entire experience, but I wasn't alone. I wasn't waking up in an ICU with a nurse who I didn't know. I, she was right there holding my hand, looking right into my eyes, saying, I'm here. And what I see every day is metaphorically, we're all in a car accident every day. We've all had something go horribly wrong. Big things, little. Th and what I encourage people to do is to just be fully present and say, it's okay, I'm here. How can I help? I'm here. Thank you for your help. And I'm here. You're not alone. And that's what I want. That's the presence that a real leader has to have every moment of every day. And we have those seeds of greatness within us. We can be fully present. We can be helping others. We can be saying, I'm here. And that's the message that I, if I had one thing for an audience to carry away, that would be it. I, I have nothing more to add to that. That was just an incredible story and, and a lesson and a message that I'm already, I think you can probably hear it in my voice. I'm already debating how I can include that more in my own life. So thank you, Doug. It's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast That's, today. Well, thank you. I, I hope it's helpful to your listeners. Uh, you're doing important work. You're creating conversations around things that matter most. And uh, I applaud that work. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and have seized hold of at least one tool, idea, or mindset that will help you start raising your own level of influence. Now, for those of you who want to take the next step in your journey or would just love a roadmap to becoming the most influential voice, idea, or brand in your space, then I have good news. You can now download the latest updated version of my ebook, The Influencer Code, from my website, juliemasters.com. Also, there's a link in the show notes. Just pop in your email address, and I promise I will not spam you, but it is jam-packed full of ideas, tools, and case studies that I have come across in my now 20-plus years of doing this work, not to mention the seven areas and seven core questions that I have found to be hands down the most valuable when it comes to immediately lifting your ability to make an impact. Download it, keep it, share it, juice it for all it is worth. I hope it makes a massive difference in both your career and your business. Thank you always to my co-founder and the main brain behind this podcast, Lauren Kelly. You kick my butt in all the right ways. Thank you for making it happen. And if you did enjoy the show, then we would love you to share this podcast and leave us a review on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, whatever your platform of choice happens to be. And don't forget to subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode.